good evening and i welcome you for our next session on stroke our chairperson is dr lc thakur dr lc thakur cv please yeah dr lc thakur he is ex professor and head department of neurology uh, and at ucms and gtb hospital and our next second chairperson is dr sudhir khetarpal and uh, dr anup kohli so i hand over to chairpersons to carry forward the session chairpersons please thank you Uh, good evening, everybody. Yes, sir. You can start with the session, sir. Please. Yeah, I don't know if the other uh, co-chairs are not visible. Uh, i would like to call upon the first speaker uh, can i have the uh, cv of uh, dr kameshwar prasad please uh, we'll have uh, current trends in thrombolytic therapy for acute ischemic stroke by professor kameshwar prasad He is the director, and he is uh, affiliated to Rajendra Institute of Medical Sciences, Ranchi. And he has numerous publications. I think uh, the numbers uh, do not match him. Special. He has special interest in stroke, multiple sclerosis, clinical trials, genetics, neuro infections, stem cell therapeutics. Uh, may I now invite Professor Kameshwar Prasad to proceed with his topic? What I intend to talk on in next fifteen minutes is uh, current trends in thrombolysis in acute ischemic stroke. So there is a paper which has come out very recently, which. Uh, actually talks about current trends in acute treatment of acute ischemic stroke and this is based on uh, Paul Porter Coverdell National Registry of USA and uh, over a period of 11 years they have plotted how practice has evolved as far as intra-arterial thrombectomy or intravenous thrombolysis or combined treatment intravenous thrombolysis follows, followed by intra-arterial thrombectomy has evolved and I want to share with you this graph I hope you are able to see this uh, you will find that from 2008 this dotted line is intravenous thrombolysis which has been growing, growing, growing. And this light line is intra-arterial thrombectomy. After the publication of, uh, you know, the major trials from 2014, it has been increasing and keeps on increasing. Intravenous thrombolysis plus intra-arterial thrombectomy is also increasing in parallel, which is by the dotted line. And therefore, intravenous thrombolysis alone has a slight tendency of, you can say, leveling off now uh, with rise of this bridging therapy as well as intra-arterial thrombectomy. So that shows what the trend is. And over a period of years, if you will see, the complication rate is going down with intravenous thrombolysis. Uh, Life-threatening complications are also going down over a period of years. As you can see, initially it was uh, symptomatic ICH was around 6%. Uh, 
which has in 2016 came down to 3% and coming down further, hopefully. Life-threatening complications are, are also going, going down from 1.4% in 2008 to 0.6%. So it has also become almost half. Mortality has also become almost half from 7% with intravenous thrombolysis to 4.9%. Similarly, able to ambulate ind independently at discharge has increased from 33.2% in 2008 to almost 50% now. And in foreign countries, uh, as you know, people are either discharged home or they go to nursing homes. And nursing homes means they are actually institutionalized. So that going home is also increasing, almost doubling from 24.2% in 2008 to 50% uh, and almost a uh, little, little bit more than 50%. So the trend shows that for whatever reasons, I'm not going into the reasons, uh, mortality and other complications are going down. Efficacy seems to be increasing in proportion that may be because of uh, our expertise in using it and we know uh, which patients are to be treated with this or it may also be because a lot of transient ischemic attacks are now getting thrombolyzed and therefore outcome is bound to be better and complications are bound to be less. So explanation can be variable, but there is definitely uh, increasing trend of efficacy and decreasing trend of harm. Indications are or contraindications are also changing. As you know, recently FDA also changed the labeling of LTEPLase and only things related to hemorrhage or hemorrhage uh, prone conditions like, you know, neoplasms or AV malformation, aneurysm or bleeding diathesis and severe uncontrolled hypertension. So the contraindication list is going down a uh, lot of contraindications which were in the beginning have become relative contraindications or uh, it's not a contraindication at all. So that's how it is, uh, uh, it has been changing. But now we are in the COVID era. So in COVID era, if uh, you must have seen, there was a V point that a stroke thrombolysis should be with tenecteplase. It will reduce spread of coronavirus disease, Emergency department treatment will be easier to manage because you don't have to have a drip. You only one shot uh, IV push injection is good enough with tenecteplase. And therefore, these authors are of the view that tenecteplase should be uh, replacing LTEPLase at least in the COVID era. And they also talk about advantages which you know there is shorter time to prepare, shorter time to administer. Instead of one hour, it is in five seconds. Does not require that a second dedicated intravenous catheter should be inserted and maintained. Does not require any intravenous infusion pump. And there is shorter time to initiate interfacility transfer after intravenous thrombolysis. So <clears throat> we uh, published a meta-analysis in 2018 which my resident, uh, Dr. Telangana, had actually led. She put in a lot of efforts under my guidance and did a, an excellent job. And we concluded that evidence so far shows that an ectoplase is as good, maybe probably slightly superior to ectoplase. They talk about those, those in most trials are 0.25 milligram per kg, and an ectoplase offers improved recanalization rates the overall out outcome may be as good as uh, uh, LTEPLase. Maybe larger trials which are ongoing will show that it is maybe slightly superior. It is already approved in India. It is less expensive, convenient to use. Therefore, as you know, I have always uh, proposed that an LTEPLase should be considered as one of the alternative to LTEPLase and may even be in the, because of less expense, uh, preferred to LTEPLase. We looked at the 
great uh, quality of evidence and as you can see there is either high or moderate quality of evidence so after this my resident said you see books don't write this and they read up to date so i wrote email to up to date i saw that what up to date writes is that it is investigational treatment so i wrote one email saying that you look here this is not consistent with evidence you position yourself as evidence based but uh, uh, that is not what is reflected in your tenectaplase statement so uh, after few months i did see that they have changed and they have referred to our meta analysis but they wrote a wrong dose which was uh, uh, maximum 90 mg which is for elteplase so i immediately wrote back saying that look here my our meta analysis shows 0.25 mg per kg is the commonest dose used with maximum of 25 mg please correct it and this time they didn't take more than a day next very next day they had corrected the doses which they had mentioned wrongly so one resident's this uh, effort it was not her thesis it was effort outside thesis changed the statement in up to date this is another thing i wanted to say so i wrote to one of my friends in canada and uh, look here what they write now is not investigational they write although not licensed in the us for thrombolysis in acute ischemic stroke treatment there is moderate to high quality evidence that intravenous tenecteplase and i told you they wrote the wrong dose which has been corrected now has similar efficacy and safety outcomes compared with elteplase and reference 61 was our is our meta analysis now the number reference number has changed but our meta analysis is still referred in up to date but i must tell you it is not approved in us and this is very surprising because uh, they approved uh, tenecteplase for mi in 2000 but not for stroke as yet but there is increasing recognition in 2019 uh, jeff saver group wrote that uh, this is non inferior we say the same thing in our meta analysis and just last uh, month we wrote a uh, editorial tenecte place prior to mechanical thrombectomy is it ready for prime time this is uh, being has been published online in neurology journal will come in print very soon and this also say that even for large vessels you should use tenecteplase as bridging therapy and uh, while more and more evidence will keep coming those who are not participating in the trial may decide to use it if they are convinced and lo and behold there is a meta analysis in large vessel occlusions intravenous thrombolysis with tenecteplase and it shows there is moderate Uh, quality as far as efficacy is concerned in uh, as far as uh, hemorrhage is concerned or uh, harm is concerned obviously you can't have a lot of harm so the data has wide confidence interval that is why it comes to low quality evidence but um, essentially it shows that you can use it as well as elteplase and these are the probably tenecteplase is superior that's why you see the whole diamond is on the right hand side but uh, there is small amount of body of data so we should wait for more data before we conclude it is superior but certainly it is as good as tenecteplase uh, so <clears throat> with this i think i will conclude by saying that tenecteplase should be used as uh, one of the preferred uh, treatment for acute uh, ischemic stroke thank you Uh, thank you prof uh, thank you professor kameshwar prasad uh, i don't know if the organizers would permit some questions there must be something for you i finished on time just yes sir yes time. sir we thank you very much and i think the dr uh, thakur should take over now for the next speaker Uh, since nobody is coming up i would like to invite uh, professor dr vinith suri he is a senior consultant and coordinator department of neurology at apollo hospital and he would be speaking on blood pressure management in primary ich so i request <laughs> dr vinith suri to go ahead so good evening i am actually going to talk on blood pressure reduction after intracerebral hemorrhage 
and this is one of the most controversial topics that you know in stroke management and it's often also the most neglected very often we find that you know when patients present with acute intracranial hemorrhage and they are being managed in the triage no antihypertensive is given you know they are just left there and uh, somebody gives a anti oral antihypertensive and no real treatment for blood pressure or definitive treatment is done uh, ich we know has been the king of negative trials with multiple uh, trials being negative but as clinicians we have to treat these patients so i'll just run through the logic and the evidence and try to give a little brief practicality on on how we should manage these patients if we look at some of the recent editorials they mentioned that you know if you have followed the literature recently and you feel confused about how to manage acute hypertension in patients with ich you are not alone and it is the most debated and controversial issue in stroke management now we we'll look at some of the logic and we we'll look at the evidence also the logic is quite strong logic to control blood pressure in intracranial hemorrhage in the first few hours is very strong but the evidence is where we have some problems and sometimes the logic is very very you know is very strong like here in this photograph the pure logic you see so many men trying to correct somebody's car the logic by the writer is that we don't know who the mechanic is but we know that the car owner is a woman so you know sometimes the logic is so strong and i think we'll go through the logic the logic is that chronic hypertension is the main risk factor which causes the rupture and therefore it is physiologically intuitive to prevent hematoma growth by controlling blood pressure there are also a number of studies which have shown that before the ich there is a substantial rise in the in the blood pressure over the pr previous days and this ultimately is the defining event which causes the intracranial hemorrhage as soon as the rupture occurs there is an increase in blood pressure which occurs because of pain stress increased sympathetic drive and a homeostatic mechanism to maintain cerebral blood flow in the phase of rising icp and this increase in blood pressure at that time causes hydrostatic pressure causing more blood to seep out into the brain therefore resulting in hematoma expansion and this hematoma expansion is related to uh, ultimate poor neurological outcome so if we look at the logic the logic is that we have to lower blood pressure because patients have higher chance of higher hematoma expansion by hydrostatic pressure the downside is that if you lower blood pressure too much then the, there is a zone of peri ischemic ischemic penumbra and here because of low blood pressure low perfusion there will be expansion of the penumbra so let's look at the evidence there are two types of evidence one to look at the logical postulation and the other is for clinical trials so when we look at the clinical the postulation there are a number of trials including the samurai study group the ich adapt they have all shown that systolic blood pressure is directly proportional to the hematoma expansion patients who have high systolic blood pressure they have higher chances of hematoma expansion and they are the patients who have ultimately poor neurological outcome and unfavorable outcome so multiple studies have shown that the blood pressure systolic blood pressure initially is directly related to outcome and therefore it is important to lower the blood pressure if we look at now the the other adverse effect that there will be worsening of the ischemic penumbra number of animal studies pet studies and a very very important landmark study the ich adapt trial in 2013 which was a ctp perfusion based study on 75 patients they showed that there is no reduction of the uh, of the cerebral perfusion around the hematoma by lowering the blood pressure so now we have evidence at least to show that you can safely lower the blood pressure and because there is no chance that there will be worsening of the perihematoma ischemia and it is important to lower the blood pressure otherwise these patients will have further hematoma expansion so let's look at now the clinical benefits of of the trials there are there were two pilot trials the interact and the attach and then the interact 2 and the attach 2 the interact and the attach 2 were uh, randomized trials the interact 2008 had about 404 patients and they compared two sets of patients those who had blood pressure of less than 140 and the standard group where blood pressure was controlled only to 180 and they found that in the intensive treatment definitely caused attenuation of the hematoma and it was safe and feasible and there was no effect on perihematoma edema similar results were also seen by the attach trial and this was then followed by the large interact trial where there was more than 2800 patients and they again compared the standard treatment of of blood pressure reduction only up to 180 against intensive 140 
and they found that there was a significantly lower mrs uh, and there was improved european quality of life index in patients in the intensive group so the intensive group the patients definitely had better mrs scores and there was a definite reduction in hematoma growth and there was definite safety and the downside was in this trial that the that the hematoma size was very small patients were had a mean of around 11 mm and these 11 ml hematomas usually do not expand so this could be one of the reasons why lot of these patients did not show benefit of hematoma expansion so this trial was a positive trial and it it mentioned that larger volume hematomas and if the treatment is started earlier within the first one hour may have a much better control by the intensive treatment that is by taking the blood pressure down to 140 because of after this trial the aha guidelines gave a class 1 level of a evidence that blood pressure systolic blood pressure reduction to 140 in patients of ich is safe and there is a class 2b level of evidence c that this also improves functional outcome even the eso guidelines also suggested that yes it is safe and it may be more superior than keeping blood pressure at 180 so therefore 140 blood pressure became the guideline blood pressure to be controlled in the first uh, uh, 24 hours the attached to trial unfortunately came out in 2016 and this came out as a negative trial and it not only showed that there was no benefit but it also showed that there were increased renal adverse effects but what if we compare the interact and attach the attach to trial actually had a mean blood pressure correction of 128 so attach to is comparing blood pressure control of more severe to 110 by to 140 systolic the interact which was positive controlled blood pressure between 140 to 180 so the inference that can be derived from here is that up to 140 blood pressure is helpful but when you control systolic blood pressure to less than 140 or less than 130 then the benefit is lost a pre pool analysis of uh, both these trials showed that there was definite benefit when you treat uh, blood pressure up to 140 and not below 130 and two meta analysis of including five trials and six trials also showed that there is safety in controlling the blood pressure to up to 140 and one could reduce hematoma growth in these patients by by lowering the blood pressure to up to 140 so when we look at the evidence the entire evidence except for one attached to which is a negative trial most of the other trials showed that there is safety in controlling the blood pressure to 140 and probably there is also benefit in in doing that so what we see, infer from these from the literature is that one has to control blood pressure to what is called as precise blood pressure what is this precise blood pressure the precise blood pressure is that it should not be too intensive it should not be less than 130 systolic but around 140 systolic is what is ideal so rather than keeping blood pressures of 180 controlling the systolic blood pressure to around 140 is what has been suggested by most of the trials the timing is that one has to try to control this blood pressure fairly early since hematoma growth occurs in the first few hours trying to control the blood pressure within the first one hour to 140 systolic is something which is very important and this has been seen in most of these trials variability has to be prevented a number of trials have shown that if the blood pressure fluctuates in the first 24 hours then the outcome is worse three to four times so blood pressure has to be controlled in the first one hour controlled to 140 systolic and with no fluctuations so for trying to prevent fluctuations one has to use intravenous agents with short half life to titrate blood pressure and patients who have a spot sign positive larger hematomas or a swirl sign or a blend sign where they are likely to have hematoma expansion are the patients to be chosen for controlling these blood pressure which antihypertensive agent to be used there are very few data on this but intravenous agents with short half life and anti sympathetic activity are the ones were to be used and nitroprusside and ntg should be avoided because they can increase the intracranial pressure so precise blood pressure control what is precise blood pressure control try to control fairly early the blood pressure target of 140 should be achieved within 1 hour of symptom onset not later on try to achieve a blood pressure of 140 less than 140 or less than 130 may be detrimental variability should be avoided so your blood pressure control should be smoother if you give uh, sublingual depen or amlodepen or oral silacar or cilindipine then the blood pressure may be very fluctuant try to use intravenous drugs 
titrate and maintain a, a variable a non variable blood pressure control agents any agent may be used try to avoid patients which may increase intracranial pressure like nitroprusside or hydrolazine preferably use intravenous agents with short half life and we have very little data if the systolic blood pressure is too high that is about 220 or in large and severe ich that, that is when the volume is more than 20 cm cube or those requiring surgical treatment so data in this category is not there so i would just like to end my talk here by saying blood pressure reduction in ich is required we have enough logic we have evidence which is controversial but the evidence shows that we should try to achieve a precise control target of 140 as early as possible non variable try to use an iv agent and select patients who are likely to have hematoma growth these are the patients that were likely to benefit thank you so much uh, thank you dr vinit suri and i would request dr thakur to take over uh, uh, i invite now dr p n ranjan he would be speaking on uh, controversies in ischemic stroke treatment and prevention He is senior consultant neurologist and academic advisor at Apollo Hospital. He has many publications. Uh, yes, sir. yes, sir. Uh, Chairperson, uh, at the very onset, let me thank Dr. Padma and Dr. Achal for giving me to speak on a very, very interesting topic. The topic is controversy in ischemic stroke treatment and prevention. I've got fifteen minutes. to cover these controversies which we have got and i will skip this few slide but except show you this slide which i love showing uh, that how has the acute acute ischemic treatment gone over from the ninch to down diffuse wake up and extend now i'm going to stress about the important advances in stroke research There are a lot of controversies. Statins, dual antiplatelets, IV TPA before mechanical thrombectomy, a new drug nerectinide, tenecteplase, clot aspiration versus clot retrieval, anesthesia, management of large infarct with low NIH score for thrombectomy, and very interestingly, the posterior circulation strokes. Now there's been a lot of interest about statins, and uh, we take back to the Sparkle trial, which was in 2006, where there was a stroke prevention aggressive reduction in cholesterol level, showed that the benefit of intensive statin treatment of atorvastatin 80 milligrams in secondary stroke prevention, but still wasn't enough. for people to accept that intensive stroke statin treatment reduces and prevents secondary stroke after a period of that from now that was january 2020 treat stroke to target trial almost 15 years later the intensive reduction of ld ldl cholesterol after a recent ischemic stroke or transient ischemic attack in the setting of atherosclerotic disease was assessed in the teeth stroke to target trial this was a parallel group single blind randomized trial in 77 centers in france korea almost 3000 patients who were randomly assigned either ldl target less than 70 target rate 90 to 100 these trial results collaborate with the sparkle and emphasize that intensive lipid management as a crucial therapeutic target in secondary atherosclerotic stroke prevention very clearly we could make this form this trial now to go a little further there are a group of patient who are very high risk patient so the came the interest should pro protein convertase 
subtilicaxin type 9 inhibitor, which is ukuklebab, added to statins in high risk patients. Ukuklebab is a monoclonal antibody. Whether adding a statin to a patient who's already had a stroke would benefit. Now, I won't go into the details of this, but you could see this that this attaches itself to the LDL particle, which goes intracellular to the lysosome. This was a very nice trial in stroke 2020, which showed that the inhibition of PCSK9 with elucubab added to statin patient with established atherosclerosis, reduced ischemic stroke and cardiovascular in the population of ski subgroup, including those with prior ischemic stroke. So this is one more controversy and one more new thing we got. I won't go into the details of this, but this is the usually can be given once in two weeks or can be given in one month. So there were a lot of new horizon in the pharmacotherapy of secondary stroke prevention. The novel approaches mean antithrombotics, lipid modifying, agents that modify glucose metabolism, and we have been talking about anti-inflammatory therapies like colchicine, which had new horizons in the pharmacotherapy of secondary stroke prevention. The second thing which we all talk about is a controversy, dual antiplatelet therapy in stroke. We are all used to this trial, which came in 2013, which was, according to me, a very good trial of 5,070 patients, but only thing, they were Chinese patients. And this study, the clopidogrel in high-risk patients with acute non-disabling cerebrovascular trial testing. The effect of dual antiplatelet treatment for the prevention of secondary stroke within 90 days following a qualified transit ischemic attack or a minor stroke. This trial showed a significant reduction in secondary stroke with those patients treated with dual antiplatelet agents. There was no difference in the rate of moderate or severe hemorrhages in both the groups. But as this was a Chinese trial, the European squad didn't believe this trial for the very simple reason that the Chinese or the Asians are different from the Europeans. Hence came in July 2018, which was called the point trial, clopidogrel and aspirin in acute ischemic stroke and high-risk TIA. The point trial showed that patients with minor ischemic stroke or high-risk TIA, those who received the combination of clopidogrel and aspirin had a lower risk of major ischemic events, but a higher risk of major hemorrhage at 90 days than those who received aspirin alone. What was the difference between chance versus point trial? I've got this for you specially. The difference is what? That the point used 600 milligram of clopidogrel placebo as a loading dose at randomization, twice the dose of chance trial. And point recommends 50 to 35 milligrams of aspirin was the chance recommendation of 75 to 300. As a result of which, the chances of hemorrhage were more in point than in chance. Hence came a meta-analysis of the outcomes associated with clopidogrel and aspirin use in minor stroke of TIA, and which showed that clearly that the patient with acute minor or trans ischemic dual antiplatelet should be initiated as soon as possible, preferably within 24 hours after symptom onset and continued for a duration of 21 days. So this is the meta analysis, which is more or less accepted from this controversy, which we've been talking about. 
Next came the Thames trials, which was internally advantage of technical law, uh, technical law and aspirin or aspirin alone in acute ischemic stroke or TIA. The acute stroke or transit is treated with technical law or ASA for prevention stroke and death. Done at 414 sites in 28 countries, compared antiplatelet, tecagrelol, 180 milligram loading dose, followed by 90 milligram twice a day, in addition to aspirin, 3 to 325 milligram on the first day, followed by 70 to 500 milligram with aspirin roll within 24 hours from the onset of minor non-cardioembolic acute stroke treatment or transplant or, 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 or ischemic attack. What did they show? The combination of technical law with aspirin was associated with lower rates of stroke or fatal event, a lower rate of ischemic events, even a more bleeding episode with the days to follow compared with aspirin monotherapy. Although tail retains the benefit of dual antiplatelet, any additional value of using technical in cyclopical still remains uncertain. Dr. Kamishu Prasad did make a passing remark about mechanical thrombectomy and should patients who undergo thrombectomy, should they get a bridging therapy with thrombolysis before the thrombectomy. Now, this is the evidence we have till now, but I think we have to have more evidence. This was a study in Lancet, which is called the TRAS trial, mechanical thrombectomy after intravenous etiplase versus etiplase alone, a randomized controlled trial. In this trial, Patients between the 18 or 18 years with acute ischemic stroll and proximal cerebral artery occlusion were randomly assigned to receive IV thrombolysis or intravenous thrombolysis plus thrombectomy. Intravenous thrombolysis, etiplase is 0.9 milligram per kilogram body weight, 10 milligram with the donors, has to be started within four hours and thrombectomy within five hours of the treatment. What was the, uh, the conclusion of the TRAS trial? Mechanical thrombectomy combined with standard intravenous thrombolysis improves functional in independence in patients with acute cerebral ischemia with no evidence of increased mortality. So TRAS trial said that the bridging therapy should be considered for all patients with large vessel occlusion of the anterior circulation. So, large vessel occlusion strokes after direct mechanical therapy and the skip trials. Now, this was a very interesting thing. We are talking about factors potentially favoring primary thrombectomy. And we are also talking about factors potentially favoring mothership bridging. What they mean by a mothership bridging is that we have a model of a skip and hub model. That if a patient is coming to the hub and there is time, the patient could be given thrombolytic therapy. But if the patient is already in a center where thrombectomy is available, then using IVTPA has to be done according to the circumstances. The direct empty and skip investigation for digitally, diligently exploring this important clinical dilemma. While the current results are not strong enough to negate the value of ATPase bridging at TCC, it is important to acknowledge there are many individual variations in the decision-making process that may not be captured in clinical trials. Finally, we are keenly waiting for the results of additional undergoing trials, and it is possible that they are already conceptualizing outdated giving 
the evidence to support the advantages of bridging with the deity place versus the deity place. Therefore, another question arises: How about bridging with the deity place? I must mention about nerdy tide and equus septitide that interferes with the postsynaptic density protein. Nerdynite is a neuroprotectant that is effective in the preclinic stroke model of ischemia and perfusion, which was studied in this trial, which I have just mentioned, which came in Lanta 2020. This was the ESCAPE NA trial. 1,150 patients were randomly assigned to receive intramesial neritibide in a single dose to a maximum dose of 270 milligram on the basis of an estimated of actual weight. All patients underwent endovascular thrombectomy and received AT place and usual care when indicated. And the conclusion of this trial was neritibide did not improve the proportion of patients receiving good clinical outcome after endovascular thrombectomy compared with patients using placebo, so which was absolutely a negative trial. I'm also getting quite fascinated by the negative place. And if you heard the lecture of Dr. Kamisha Prasad, long half-life, interestingly, more fibrin specific. Now, why connective place and TPA? That is why, as I just said, fibrin specific, fibrinogen depletion, PAI1 resistance. The first trial which came with TPA was the Nostest trial in 2018, which is the Danish trial. And they found connective place was not superior to a TPA and showed a similar safety profile. Most patients in this study had mild strokes. Further trials are needed to establish the safety and efficacy in patients with severe stroke and whether telective place is non-inferior to eti place. Now, this was a very interesting trial. This is extend A1 telective place trial. Tenecti place versus AT place before thrombectomy for ischemic stroke. Now, this is a trial which took patients with ischemic stroke who had occlusion of the internal carotid artery basal or MCA and are ineligible to undergo thrombectomy. They were given tenecti place 0.25 milligram per kilogram body weight, AT place 0.9 milligram per kilogram body weight, equal number of patients in the two arms. The primary outcome occurred in 22% of the patients with directly placed and 10% with eti placed. What did it show? The directly placed before thrombectomy was associated with higher incidence of reconfusion and better functional outcome than eti placed among patients with ischemic stroke treated within 4.5 hours. So this is another evidence to say that tenecti place is superior to eti place in recanalization of the patient in 1.5 hours of the stroke. Thus, endovascular treatment for patients with acute ischemic stroke who have large ischemic core and large mismatch, you tend to leave them. But I would say, and the study from JAMA said, that in a properly selected patient, endovascular treatment appears to benefit patients with large core and large mismatch profile, but future prospective studies are warranted. A last couple of slides only. Aspiration was the sent receiver for successful revitalization. Should you do aspiration of the thrombus or you should do a sent stent retriever. This was again in JAMA in 2070, which is called the ASTER trial. And the other one was a siesta trial. Both of them showed that the, uh, the device was, the retriever was better than the aspiration. 
maybe the previous trial did show better aspiration because we didn't have better stent retriever. Now we have better quality of stent retriever. Siesta 2016. And the other one was Gothet 2018. Both showed the effect of general anesthesia and conscious sedation during endovascular therapy in fact growth in clinical outcome and acute stroke. And this was a randomized trial, which very clearly showed that general anesthesia was better than conscious sedation for endovascular therapy because it does not increase the infarct side. So patients who underwent thrombectomy and acute ischemic stroke caused by large vessel occlusion that the anterior circulation, GA did not result in worse time of clinical outcome compared to, to CS. Just last two slides before I end, we've been talking about, we talk less about posterior circulation stroke, but without realizing that 20 to 25% of strokes do form posterior circulation. Most of the randomized trials do IV thrombolysis of mechanical thrombectomy, except for a very few enrolled patients, the TRESS trial have been restricted to patients with anterior circulation. Yet clinical experience with treating posterior circulation factor, these therapies exist. Basilar artery occlusion can be devastating unless recanalization is achieved. Registered data indicate that IVTPA and mechanical thrombectomy can result in functional independence at three months. In 30 to 40% of cases, these rates and a favorable outcome are clinically clear than those reported without perfusion therapy. The value of endovascular therapy for acute basal artery occlusion is currently being investigated in the basal artery international cooperative study. Even among patients who are treated with reperfusion test, strategy mortality remains very high. So ladies and gentlemen, I end by saying statins, certain dual antiplatelet, yes, IVTPA, mechanical thrombectomy, weight, neritinamide, no, tenecti plate, yes, clot aspiration, clot removal is the answer, general anesthesia, managed large infarct, and posterior circulation stroke. This is my Apollo stroke unit where I work. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for a very patient hearing. Uh, thank you, Dr. P. N. Ranjan. And uh, I would like Dr. Thakur to take over. I don't know. Hello. Uh, can I, uh, Dr. L.C. Uh, Thakur hear me? Okay, then uh, I'll invite uh, the next speaker, uh, Dr. Atul Prasad. <sighs> he will be speaking on current consensus on management of in incidentally detected cerebrovascular lesions. Uh, Dr. Atul Prasad is uh, the senior neurologist, director and head of the department at BLK Super Specialty Hospital. So I request uh, Dr. Atul Prasad to take over. Uh, thank you, Sudhir. Uh, can you see my slide? Yes, yes. Yes, sir. Thank you, Sudhir. And thank you, Achal and Dr. Padma uh, for inviting me. And uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And a very special welcome to Dr. Pushpa, who's joined all the way from Boston, Cambridge, uh, to, to, to attend my talk. Anyway, so what I'll do in the next 15 minutes is try to take you through, through my journey with the incidentally detected cerebrovascular lesions. And what are they? What I mean by incidentally detected cerebrovascular diseases are three. One is incidentally detected brain infarcts. Second is white matter hyperintensities, and second, third is microbes. And I'll take each one of them and discuss uh, how to manage them. So these are I'm going to talk about first is the white matter hyperintensities of presumed vascular origin, and when I say vascular origin, I mean only vascular origin. There's a large differential diagnosis for 
for white matter hyperintensities. And this talk is not about uh, all of them, it's only about the vascular lesions. And how do we reach that? We reach it by going through a differential diagnosis. And when we reach it, uh, we, we should know how to manage it. And this is how my journey started with the white matter hyperintensity. We've all seen it. We've seen it when we were residents. We've seen it when we were consultants. And I don't know how, how much any of us really concentrate on. Let me start with a story. This is a lady, 72 years old, who had a teleconsult on 7th January. And she had B2 neuralgia on the right side, and she was hypertensive. And like, uh, like all our patients, I asked for MRI along with the other test. And this is what the MRI report came. MRI report came as showing some white matter hyperintensities, cerebral white matter hyperintensities, probably of ischemic changes. And that should have been the end of the matter. But then she messaged me. She messaged me that, uh, doctor, I want to consult you again. And I want to know about these white matter hyperintensities. What are they? And am I a higher risk of stroke? or heart attack. So what do you do when somebody writes to you like that? So the first thing is you tell them that uh, I need to see the MRI myself. We don't know what, what, it, what, what exactly it has shown. Basically, you try to buy time. So what she did was she took a picture and sent it. And she said, these are the scans of my mother. And you're seeing some lesions here. And tell me about them. So that was as far as I could do to, to procrastinate. So I told her, don't worry. Don't worry about it. And uh, I'll come back to this patient uh, later. Uh, we just said that control the blood pressure and wait and watch. But then when I, when I disconnected the phone, I went back and reviewed the literature. And my next 10 minutes of talk will be mainly about what the, what the consensus guidelines is. What the consensus guidelines is, is a 2017 paper on what do you do when you see lesions like these in the brain when you don't expect it. And let me start off with white matter hyperintensities. Now, white matter hyperintensities are fairly common. They're fairly common. And you'll see them in more than 90% of individuals more than 70 years of age. However, however, at some point, some point, they become abnormal. They become abnormal. They are more than what is normal for age. And what is that? What is that threshold? What is that limit where they become abnormal? That nobody knows. So when we do not know, when we do not know what is the critical uh, mass of white matter hyperintensities, we have a lot of people who, who, who give us uh, some idea of what to do. And one of them is Fazekas grading. Now Fazekas grading of this white matter hyperintensity is quite simple. One, zero is abscess. One is punctate. Two is punctate, which are getting joined to each other. And three are more extensive. It's important to grade them because Fazekas 2 and Fazekas 3 means that they are more than what is appropriate for age. And if they are more than what is appropriate for age, then they become a risk factor for stroke. See, the meta-analysis shows that all of them, all of them falls on the right side. Right side means these are individuals which are at high risk of stroke. So white matter hyperintensities is normal, but at some stage, they become more than what is normal. And when they become more than what is normal, then they become a marker marker for, for uh, streaming stroke later on in life. So what do you do? What do you do? We uh, control the blood pressure. Patient has, has blood pressure and blood pressure changes have been shown to, to, to reduce the, the progression of white matter hypertensities. We can try blood sugar lowering, but blood sugar lowering did not really reduce the white matter progression. We can give vitamin B and folate therapy. It doesn't really work. We have studies for that, it doesn't really work. And if you're like uh, me, uh, who, who looks at the patient as a whole, you do everything which is possible. You control the blood pressure, advise them uh, lifestyle change, treat the lipids, and uh, hope for the best. There's some studies, there's some data to show that the white matter changes become less if you do a more holistic management for these patients. What you should not do, what you should not do for this patient is put them on antiplatelets. Because antiplatelets do not show, do not have not shown to be of any benefit in this white matter hyperintensities. In fact, in fact, these patients may be at increased risk of uh, brain hemorrhage. So help them if you can. Do not harm them. Antiplatelets are not really indicated. So the guidelines say that when you see the happen, my white matter hyperintensities, you look at the primary prevention of stroke guidelines, not secondary prevention, because secondary prevention would include 
would include aspirin or clopidogrel. You look at primary prevention and try to control the risk factors as much as possible. So you stratify them depending on the risk factors they have. Use whatever scale you believe in, whatever scale you're familiar with, and control the risk factors. And this is what I what, what I did or what I advised my patient. I told her not to worry, control the blood pressure, and uh, that's it. This is a second situation where, where uh, patients may have these kind of lesions. They may have silent brain infarcts, which are defined as uh, small strokes. See this CT scan? I don't know if you can see it. There's a small hole out here. And this is the MRI lesion, which are showing a density, which is nearly the same as that of CSF. So these are small infarcts, which you may see incidentally on, uh, on an MRI. In a patient who does not uh, have history of infarcts or stroke, and what do you do for them? So first thing is you make sure you make sure that they are in infarcts and not dilated vocal organ spaces. And how do you do that? Look at the size, less than 1.5 centimeter, 3 to 15 millimeter. They are ovoid as opposed to linear shaped. And they're in deep ganglia and posterior fossa. Uh, dilated vocal organ spaces will hardly be, will hardly ever be seen in the posterior fossa. Okay, so that's something that you should remember. So in your mind, if you see spaces like these, you know that they are in infarcts and they have been asymptomatic. Now, asymptomatic infarcts are fairly common, fairly common in patients more than 80 years, not patients, on people more than 80 years of age, maybe 25% of them will have this. And it has been estimated that for every single symptomatic stroke, there are 10 patients who will have silent brain infarcts. They are much more common, much more common. However, however, what is more important is that if you see an MRI, if you see a MRI which shows silent, which shows infarcts, and then there's no history, again, these infarcts are an additional risk factor, an additional risk factor for further stroke, for further stroke over and above if you, if you correct for all the other risk factors. Look at this. I don't know if you can see this box out here. So even trait in individuals without silent infarcts and with silent infarcts, it's almost double. 0 0.95, 1.87 is almost double. 0 0.16, 0 0.5, nearly four times that. So uh, patients with silent infarcts or MRI changes of silent infarcts are at higher risk, at higher risk for, for subsequent stroke as opposed to a brain or MRI of a brain which does not show silent infarcts. So what do you do? So when you see a patient who's having infarcts, a lacuna infarct, a small infarct, or a silent infarct, there are two possibilities. One possibility is you see it in the deep uh, brain tissue, or you see it in the cortex. It's important to differentiate these two, whether it's in the cortex or whether it's in the deep, uh, uh, deeper brain tissue, because that will tell you the origin of why the patient had it and your approach changes. I always tell my residents, you should always answer the question when you see a patient of stroke, either the MRI or the patient of stroke, answer the question, why, why did I have the stroke? Try to find out the cause or the origin of the stroke. If you do that, then you can tell the patient that's why he had a stroke and we can prevent a further mishap from occurring. So most of the subcortical strokes, are more than 80 to 90 percent, are lacuna infarct, small infarct. And the commonest risk factor is hypertension. Control the hypertension, and that should be it. But a small portion of them, about 20%, are cortical or large infarcts. And you should treat the cortical or large infarcts as you would, as you would treat a patient who has a symptomatic uh, stroke. That means look for a source, look for a source, and the source is usually the heart or the carotid territory. That means you should screen the heart, you should do an ECG, you should do an echo, and you should do a carotid vascular imaging to see the patient is having stenosis. But there's a caveat, and I'll come to that later. Now, stenosis of internal carotid artery can be symptomatic, or it could be asymptomatic. Uh, there can be critical stenosis, or it could be non-critical stenosis. If there's a critical stenosis, there's a high risk of subsequent stroke, about 10 to 15% per year, as opposed, as opposed to less than 2% who are asymptomatic, or who is how for having uh, non-critical stenosis. And with non-critical stenosis, we mean about 50 to 99%. And the guidelines say that if a patient has had a stroke, if a patient has had a stroke and the corresponding internal carotid uh, in the neck is stenosed by 50 to 90, 99%, and the duration of stroke is less than six months, it's an indication for intervention. 
Now, whatever is in yellow is important. So there should be a critical stenosis and there should be a streaming stroke in the last six months. However, however, if you have if you have a patient with an asymptomatic disease, asymptomatic infarction, we do not know, we do not know when the stroke was. So if you do not know when the stroke was, you do not know whether it was less than six months back or more than six months back. More than six months back, it didn't, doesn't really matter what you do because the collaterals have established and it may not help, it may not help to go for a for a carotid endarterectomy. So the risk of stroke in patients who are asymptomatic and who are having a cortical infarct, not a subcortical, cortical infarct will be halfway between a symptomatic and an asymptomatic uh, patient. You may leave them alone because you do not know the duration when it happened or you may intervene depending upon center to center, what the center preferences are, what the center perioperative risks are. So if you have a non-critical stenosis, the matter is closed. But if you have a critical stenosis, you do not know when the infarct and you have a corresponding infarct in the cortical territory. You're not sure when it happened. You're not sure when it happened. It may be less than six months, maybe more than six months. This totally depends on the center. It depends on the neurologist, what you want to do next for this patient. So it may be reasonable to do uh, to, to follow primary uh, stroke prevention guidelines. Again, antithrombotics in these kind of patients do not have much role, and they may they may we do not really have any trials to tell us to tell us whether antithrombotics should be added to these kind of patients or not. So the guidelines say the 2017 guidelines say treat them as primary stroke prevention guidelines. Do not put the patients on aspirin. Last part on the five minutes. Uh, microbleeds, I thought Ranjan will cover that, but it doesn't matter. Uh, microbleeds are small, 5 to 10 millimeter areas of signal loss in uh, susceptibility images. We, all, we have all seen these. And there are two common causes. There are two common causes of silent cortical microbleeds. One is hypertension, second is cerebral, artery, uh, cerebral amyloid, amyloidosis. There are other causes. There are other causes. And you should, of course, remove them. You should take them off one by one look for coagulopathies, look for infective endocarditis. And larger hemorrhages are to be treated as similar to intracranial hemorrhages. I'm not talking about them, we're talking of microbleeds. Microbleeds, by definition, is less than one centimeter. So again, you should look where the microbleeds are. Just like we look for silent stroke, we should look where the microbleeds are. And the options are that they can be in the deep brain stem, deep brain locations, where the commonest cause is, of course, uh, hypertension or it could be in the lobar location. And if, the, if they are in the lobar location, then the commonest cause, commonest cause is amyloidosis. Okay, so if that can be in the, in, the, in the cortex, amyloidosis, subcortical hypertension. If they are in both the location, then it could be either. It could be amyloidosis or it could be hypertension. So you should investigate them, control the hypertension part. You may or you may not decide to do more further investigation that includes CT angiography, CT venography, depending upon the resources which are available to you, depending on where the, the hemorrhages are, depending on how big the hemorrhages are. If they're very small micro hemorrhages, maybe, maybe not. So the only thing to be done for this patient is of course, uh, control the blood pressure and keep your fingers crossed. But I'll talk about two particular situations. I'll talk about two particular situations where you see this cortical microbleeds, which may change your management. One are the patients where you may consider warfarin or anticoagulants. Now, if you want to give anticoagulants, we know that there's a risk of brain hemorrhage. You know there's a risk of brain hemorrhage and you're worried about that. However, however, the, the advantage of giving anticoagulants to prevent to prevent another stroke is, is very high. It's very high and the recommendations say that you should not, you should not stop or, or withhold anticoagulants for these patients. However, however, keeping in mind that there's an option, option of just a closure of the left atrial appendage uh, rather than using anticoagulation long term. So you should be aware that there's a second option, but if you're forced or if you decide to give anticoagulation, it doesn't matter, go ahead and do it. As of today, we do not have a, uh, our guidelines do not do not uh, stop us from from using uh, uh, anticoagulation for our patients. Second situation is thrombolysis. Now, what the many thrombolysis whether they use uh, intravenous uh, or intraarterial RT place or, or uh, uh, place or you do endothermy. Uh, these are established treatment. However, 
However, the most important risk for using this therapy is of course bleeding. Is bleeding, and if we can predict, if we can predict which patient will bleed, we will know when to give, when not to give. And these micro bleeds may be a risk factor. May be a risk factor. May tell us which patient will bleed if you use the thrombolytic therapy. Uh, if, Dr. Prasad, I would like request you to wind up. To wind up, just another yeah, two yeah. minutes. Yeah. Sure. So Thank the you. chances of micro bleeds is nearly double. It's nearly double if you have micro bleeds. However, the advantage of giving uh, tenecteplase or alteplase far far outweighs the 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 risk of bleeding. And as of today, the recommendations say that go ahead and thrombolyze. Again, keeping in mind, again keeping in mind that there's a there's the option option of uh, going in for for thrombo like for endovascular treatment, which will prevent which will prevent uh, the chances of bleeding. So, in summary, I just go through all of these. I already gone through that uh, guidelines. Say whatever you see, whether you see white matter happy intensities or you see small silent stroke, treat them for primary therapy. Primary preventive therapy. Do not do not give aspirin for this patient. It doesn't really work. You may cause more harm. And just to come back to my patient, uh, I told her uh, control the blood pressure, and that's it. Don't worry about it. You'll be fine. And one week later, this is what happened. I don't know if you can see it. I did not put her on antiplatelets, and this patient with white matter hypertensity developed a stroke. One week later, she developed a stroke. Very embarrassing. So the take-home message, take-home message is when you see these silent lesions, do not, do not neglect them, do not pass it off as normal, do not pass them off as innocuous, work on them, look at them, and remember there's always a gap between evidence-based medicine and real-world situations. Treat each patient separately, treat each patient as he or she is your relative and do what is best for them. Thank you. Thank you, Sadiq. Dr. Sridhar, can you ask a question? Uh, I don't think so because we don't have time and we are waiting no, for the just, presidential just, oration. Just one small comment, if you allow. Uh, that's what I say. You know, I I would like the, uh, the organizers to give you permission. Uh, I would uh, like to thank uh, all the speakers, uh, Professor Kameshwar Prasad for uh, giving us the current trends in thrombolytic therapy, Dr. Vineet Suri for giving us the management of blood pressure, uh, Dr. P. N. Ranjan for controversies in ischemic stroke and uh, Dr. Atul Prasad giving us information on management of incidentally detected cerebral vascular. I thank all these speakers and uh, i'm grateful though i'm sorry that uh, they didn't stick to the time and i would like the organizers to take it. thank you thank you sir uh, we have come to the end of this session and i thank the chairpersons dr lc thakur dr sudhir khetripal uh, uh, and the speakers of this session